I'm really excited to share the story of our next guest. It's um, empowering and just um, really exciting how this person went from a junkie to a judge. And just all the tips she has about her, her process of getting to that point. So please watch. Building spirituality, family, health, and business. This is The Giant Builders with Lois Wyant. Hey, welcome Giant Builders. I'm so happy you're here. And today's guest is Mary Beth O'Connor. Hello, Mary Beth. How are you? Hi, good to see you. I'm doing well. Great. Thank you. Well, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your story? Yes, yeah, so I, I read a memoir which sort of captures the essence of it, and it's called From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. Uh, and so I, I really wanted to capture the whole arc. So I show sort of the child abuse, the neglect that led drugs to look appealing to me at a young age. I mean, I started with alcohol at 12, and by 17, I was shooting meth. Um, and I didn't get sober until I was 32. So it was a really long haul. But there is a, a real strong connection between trauma and PTSD and, and developing a substance use disorder. Um, but then I did, the, you know, the usual chaos of, of my addiction. But I also wanted to sort of show what recovery really looks like, because I felt like a lot of memoirs is sort of like I went to a couple of meetings and everything was great. And it's like, that's not how recovery works. Um, so 30% of my book really goes through the first three years of my recovery, where it was not just recovery from substances, but from my mental health challenges and my trauma. Um, but I go through sort of how I thought about it, the way I approached it, you know, setting plans and goals. Um, so I wanted to show the sort of the whole picture. And that's really sort of the core of the story. So at what point or what, what nudged you to break the abuse? Or yeah. The movies. Yeah. And so, I mean, a lot of people think that for most of it's just sort of this light bulb, like one thing moment. Um, and that can happen. Sometimes people get like a DUI or something and it's sort of the, you know, the, cam the straw that broke the camel's back. But for many of us and for me, it was really hum a, a, a several different factors that were hitting me at the same time. And so um, I said I had worked my way down the corporate ladder <laughs> because I had a Berkeley degree, but I couldn't hold a job because I couldn't get there because I was using meth all the time. Um, I was really, you know, exhausted, like deeply, extremely exhausted. I was in a state of despair. My partner was ready to throw me out. And so it was sort of everything in combination that made me s say to him, well, you know, well, what if I go to rehab? <laughs> you know? And so that was really the impetus. Um, but it wasn't sort of a light bulb. And it wasn't that I felt confident that I could get sober because I really doubted, you know, at first that I could. It was more that this is a horrible place. It's been horrible for a long time. Let's see if I can find a way to at least make it better. What, let's say, if somebody listening is either in a substance situation or has a family member what suggestions would you give to them since you've been in the other side of it? I mean, part of the reason I share my story and talk about, you know, in particular shooting meth, which is really viewed in America as sort of like the bottom of the barrel, right? It would be better if I were recovering from alcohol. Not that that's easy, but it's less, it's stigmatized, but not as stigmatized. And so part of it was to really show that recovery is on the table, no matter how low your bottom is. Um, I mean, I had ch child physical and sexual abuse. I had two multi-assailant rapes. I lived with a violent boyfriend. I, you know, used drugs at a very severe level for 15 years. And yet I did find a way to get sober. And I now have 29 years of continuous sobriety. And I was able to build a happy and productive life. And so it's sort of to help re be a reassurance and sort of an example that this is on the table. Um, and for friends and family, I, I really point them to the, the new way of thinking. It, you know, there was that old sort of tough love approach where you're supposed to disconnect and shut them off until they hit this fantasy horrible bottom and come begging for help. Um, but today, the evidence shows that that's actually not the best approach. It's really better to do some positive reinforcement techniques. And there's a new approach called CRAFT. It's community reinforcement and family training. 
Um, and it's, it's described a lot in the book Beyond Addiction. And it talks about having honest conversations with the person who's using substances, sort of where are they? What, 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 is, what are the substances serving? What are they, what, what's the benefit? Because there's usually something going on underneath, but also to work with them to help them figure out what their options might be to sort of use positive reinforcement in any positive steps forward to help them, you know, start to feel a little stronger in their sobriety efforts, or at least thinking about getting sober. So those are some of the general ideas. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, so uh, at what point did you become a judge? <laughs> so, uh, so I actually had gone to law school to Berkeley law right out of college. Um, but so I had I had done a little better the first three and a half years of college on my drug use. And I always emphasize the word better, not good, better. <laughs> um, but, you know, I had that really bad multi-assailant rape in college and I moved in with a violent boyfriend. And that in January, my senior year, I started using meth again every day. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to law school the first time by the fall, I was in no shape to do it. I mean, law school had been my original intention. That's what I wanted. And I got accepted to Berkeley Law. But, you know, from January to September, I was in completely in, a, you know, again, in a deep seated daily use of meth. And so I couldn't get there. I mean, I couldn't get there. I was missing classes. So I ended up withdrawing because I knew I was going to fail if I didn't. And so that was sort of this pain in the in the next 10 years that I had had like a top 10 law school in my hands and I had to give it back because of my addiction. It was just agonizing to drive past that building. I hated to drive past that building. Um, so when I got sober, it was sort of in the back of my mind, but yet I, I was in a very different place 10 years later. You know, as I said, I worked my way down the corporate ladder. I had, a, I had an embarrassing resume for somebody with a Berkeley degree and good grades. Um, so I had to start from where I was. I wasn't ready to sort of leap ahead. And so my first job when I got home from rehab was a part-time temporary low-level admin job because for me to get up and go to work every day on time and stay the whole day and do a good job and do it the next day and the next, I was 32 and I had never done it in my life. <laughs> so I sort of needed that practice and to get my feet underneath me. Um, and then I moved up from there to, you know, several jobs, increasing responsibilities, you know, supervisory jobs, bigger companies. And at six and a half years sober, I went to law school for real. Um, and so that so it was always in my mind. And then after I graduated, I worked at a big law firm for a while. And then I did class action work for the federal government. And then I always emphasize when I had 20 years sober, <laughs> I was appointed a federal administrative law judge. So it wasn't like I got into recovery thinking I want to be a judge one day. <laughs> you know, it was it was really like, what's what's the right first step? What's the right next step? You know, and it just gradually over 20 years worked its way to the point that I ended up being a judge. So that's sort of how it played out. So I'm curious, as a judge, did your own life experience encourage or help you to look at things differently from for people? Yeah, I mean, I didn't do criminal cases, but I did do the kind of cases where substance use disorder came up. But it was also seeing a lot of people that had mental health issues from trauma, right? I mean, most substance use disorder is a pain response, right? People are trying to deal with their pain or they're trying to self-medicate mental health. I mean, that's a very high percentage of people that have a have a substance use disorder. So I definitely saw people that had clearly been struggling, that had trauma history similar to mine, that had drug history similar to mine. Um, and I had to, but, you know, at the same time, there's law that I'm required to apply. And so I have to follow, you know, follow the rules, but I certainly understood. And I was certainly not going to make negative judgments about sort of who they were as people, because I know that they can move forward from there um, if they can get the right help. Hmm. Are there different types of help for people? I can't imagine that everybody fits into one mold. So are there different options? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple ways that, for me to answer that. One is that um, when I got sober, we talked about what was called addiction then, and now the, the modern terminology is substance use disorder because that puts it more in the medical box. You know, I'm a person who had a substance use disorder. Like you might, I would be a person with diabetes or with anxiety or whatever. But today, when I got sober, we talked about it like there was this invisible line that one day you didn't know when you crossed it. You didn't know. But one day you went from drug abuser to drug addict. 
But but that's not the modern way of looking at it. Today, we categorize substance use disorder as mild, moderate, or severe. So it's sort of on a spectrum, just like other mental health disorders. You can have depression, mild, moderate, or severe, or anxiety, mild, moderate, or severe. So what treatment uh, you need can depend on where you fall on that spectrum. Like inpatient treatment isn't necessary for everyone. You know, a person with a mild substance use disorder may not need inpatient treatment. Um, the other thing is that not everybody who needs it can get it. I, a lot of people don't have the financial ability to um, go inpatient. Uh, it's you know cost prohibitive, um, but it can but it can depend on where you are, what supports you have. Do you have a job? Do you have a supportive family? Um, are you a caretaker? I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into the decision about what's the right treatment. But the other thing is today we focus on long term plan like that really people need supports for like 12 to 18 months if they're going to have the best chance of success doesn't mean inpatient, but working, you know, doing uh, outpatient care or aftercare, uh, it can be called when you leave a treatment program, sometimes they have where you can go to a meeting once a week at the facility, you know, as an aftercare, people use um, recovery coaches, or they work with therapists who have expertise. But then also in the peer support meetings, like 12 Steps, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, that's peer support. There are a lot of peer support options. And I wasn't a 12 step person. I pulled a couple ideas, but it wasn't right for me. And so today you can choose from, um, you know, AA, NA, all the A's, you know? <laughs> uh, but also um, Smart Recovery, Life Ring, Secular Recovery. I'm on the board. Um, she Recovers Foundation, Women for Sobriety, Recovery Dharma, and others. And with newcomers, I always encourage them to look at um, the philosophy, but also the meeting formats, because the meeting formats can really vary. And you might be uh, more attracted to one type of meeting format than another. So there is a lot more choice today. And there's sort of a little more nuanced of a way of looking at it as far as what's going to be right for you. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, is there any other thing you think the listeners should know? Um, I do think it's important for the person with a substance use disorder to be the one making the choices. You know, sometimes friends and family get caught up in what they think, you know, the person, you have to go in, in patient, right? Well, not everybody does. Or, or sometimes when, um, people pick programs other than, you know, 12 steps, the family can get upset because they never heard of it. And so they're, they're worried it's not real or it's not as successful, but, let me reassure family members that there, there have been studies and basically they, the other options are as um, as successful as 12 steps. It's really about what's the right fit. And so I always encourage people to, um, you know, to do that individual assessment. Where am I going to do well? But also that the plan, cha plan changes over time. Right. And so it's sort of it's an iterative process. And what I need at one point in my recovery and what I need later could be very different. Um, and the other thing is, if someone has a mental health disorder in addition to a substance use disorder, which many do, I had PTSD and I didn't even know it, severe anxiety. Today, um, somebody going in for substance treatment should be evaluated for other mental health conditions right in the beginning, because if they're tackled together um, from the start, the odds of success are higher. And so those are some of the things I would encourage people to think about. Oh, great information so much available now that I wasn't even aware of. I think that you kind of get caught up in the, maybe the old movie stories, you know? <laughs> well, and even today, I mean, all, almost all of what you see in movies or TV is 12 steps. It's one reason I wrote my book because I mean, I, I don't, I support 12 steps when it's the right fit, but it wasn't right for me and it's not right for a lot of people. And so my book talks about doing it the other way as an individual plan, taking, you know, figuring out what's going to work for you. Uh, but yeah, there it is uh, what you see, you know, it's media, right? It's often you see the sort of the generic version and not the the more complicated, more nuanced version that actually is better. Um, we really do focus on people building their own personal plan. Um, and some of the other approaches are really different. Like, you know, in life ring, we focus on self empowerment rather than viewing yourself as powerless. Um, but there's a lot of differences from one to one. 
But the good news is there's so many choices today and you can Google them on the internet. You know, when I got sober in 94 to find the options, I had to go to the library, yeah. <laughs> to go to the library <laughs> do the research. I had to send, call 800 numbers and send checks to PO boxes like that. Those were the days. But today, all of this information is available online, especially once you know to look for it. You know, it's all there, which helps people find um, what's going to give them the best chance of success. Well, that's great. I mean, you really opened my mind up to the concepts as far as like how to get help, being more positive, encouraging, and just just to see you. I mean, just the, the beauty that you've made in the changes in your life. And um, man, I am so proud of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, and I will say, you know, the judge thing, I'm proud of it. It's an accomplishment, but it's really not the most important part of my recovery. You know, it was, it's a job. I mean, in a certain way, um, but the joy of recovery is really sort of that lack of chaos, <laughs> the lack of obsession, you know, being able to like show up for your friends and family, being able to be a good wife and all, and, and to be of service to my community. I mean, these are the joys of recovery. Um, I, I'm proud of my professional accomplishments, but you know, in the long run, those other things are really sort of more part of the strong foundation than what job I happen to have. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Very, very, very inspiring. So what's the name of your book? From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. And it is available on Amazon and all the usual sites. You know, I also have written a number of opinion pieces and they're on my website, junkietojudge.com. Uh, so I do have a lot of information there. Oh, great. All right. So listeners, we're going to give uh, Mary Beth's book away. So leave a comment below and we'll have a drawing and we'll give away one of her books. So, you know, listeners, you may or may not know of or be familiar with somebody who might have an addiction. Um, but just, I hope that you'll re-listen to this and just see the positive aspects and options that are available to help them. I, I think we should not ignore these types of situations. So any closing shots? Uh, no, I mean, of course, anyone listening, if I can ever be of use, let me know. My husband says this isn't what retirement is supposed to look like. But, you know, I, I view this time as my my chance to give back, you know, now that I'm not a judge anymore, now that I'm not working. Um, but and, and I really appreciate you inviting me on the show and being able to share this information. You know, that is um, that's really part of my core mission at this point. So thank you so much for having me. So oh, that's a mighty mission. I'm very excited to share that mission with you. So, all right, Giant Builders, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. This has been The Giant Builders with Lois Wyant.